Today's guest is a staunch advocate for intellectual freedom. She is currently an associate professor at the University of Illinois and has authored pivotal works on censorship and information ethics, including her award-winning book, Foundations of Intellectual Freedom. Her research and advocacy have taken her from academic circles to the halls of the U.S. Senate, where she has testified on the pressing issues of book banning. Please welcome Emily Knox. Taking a trip back to your childhood, what books or authors inspired your love for reading? My favorite author is still Tamara Pierce, um, who wrote the Song of the Lioness series, which I started reading when I was eight. Um, and I have read her books ever since. Um, I would say when it comes to books that have been censored, Judy Bloom was my favorite. I read as many of her books as possible, but I would say I was inspired to read. Um, my mother was a school librarian, and so uh, I read a lot. We went to the library all the time. Um, I've just always loved reading. What were the type of books that you liked reading? Like, what, what genres were you mostly reading? So when I was little, I read a lot of historical fiction. Um, Anne Rinaldi was one of my favorite authors. Um, and I started reading fantasy, and that's with Tamara Pierce. And so uh, that's actually the genre I have kept with. I also read a lot of mysteries. I fell in love with uh, Sherlock Holmes in like third grade, and I decided to read all the short stories. I've loved mysteries since then. And I also read um, romances. I'm a genre reader. I read some literary fiction, but only if it really interests me. So I really stick with fantasy, mysteries, and romances. In your book, Foundations of Intellectual Freedom, you explore various dimensions of intellectual freedom. Could you discuss how this foundation influences your stance on the current wave of book bans across U.S. and its impact on diverse narratives? Yeah, so my work really focuses on reading. I'm very interested in what does it mean to read? Why is reading so important in the global north, right? Like we talk about literacy, but I'm not so much focused on literacy, but on the actual act of reading. So um, I talk about how people interpret texts. And basically when people try to censor a book, what they are saying is something will happen if someone reads this book. They will become a different person of whom I disapprove. Um, and so I try to talk about, like, what does that mean? How do we understand that? Um, in Foundations of Intellectual Freedom, I'm really focused on this concept of intellectual freedom, um, that it is really residing in a person, um, that we all have the right to intellectual freedom, to freedom of expression. Um, and I talk about how that plays out with different areas. So things like information access. I talk about copyright because copyright is really the law related to information access um, and intellectual freedom. Um, so those are the sorts of things I focus on in my work. What are some effective ways communities can fight against book bans? Yeah, so uh, there are several things to do. The main thing is to organize. So along with my being an associate professor, I'm also the chair of the board of the National Coalition Against Censorship. Um, we actually have programs, including the Kids' Right to Read Network, which really um, emphasizes how, you know, it's actually youth who are most impacted by censorship. The NCAC is also part of the Unite Against Book Bans, which comes out of the American Library Association. Um, so when I say organize, what I actually mean is when something happens in your town to show up, to protest, to encourage your kids to show up, um, to speak at the public, you know, the public statements during a board meeting, everybody has the right to do that. Um, you really get to see uh, our Republican democracy in action, right, by talking to the people who have been elected to have um, oversight over your public institutions. So um, where I've seen this work best is when people actually don't just show up at the board meeting, but they meet beforehand to talk about what 
their message will be? Who will be the best person to respond to whatever is happening, to make the signs? Um, that is really what organization is about and protest, um, to really have a clear idea of what you're asking for and how you will communicate that message. You've taken to a national platform testifying before the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee on the issue of book banning. This is a significant step in the fight for intellectual freedom. Could you share your experience and the impact this testimony had on the conversation around book bans? Yeah, so I was invited to speak um, by Senator Dick Durbin, my senator, um, who is the ranking member of the U.S. Uh, Judiciary Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, it was extremely nerve wracking. I've not done something that scary uh for a very long time you have to prepare very quickly i had about two weeks to prepare you have to prepare both written statements written remarks and also um, a five minute introductory statement so i spent two weeks just working on that um i will say that for me going was really quite profound um the Senate Judiciary Committee meets in an office building. Anybody can go and watch the committee hearings. Uh, you just have to go through security. You get in this big office building, um, and uh, it is open to the public. Um, I think that we really take for granted how, um, in many ways, accessible our federal government is um, that anybody could be there. They have to be invited to speak, of course, but it was important that, you know, my family was able to come and be with me um, and other people are there. Um, it is organized chaos. So the senators are coming in and out the whole time uh, and you have to answer all these questions. They really go off topic. Um, but I really felt, um, you know, it was such an honor to be asked uh, to really talk about the importance of the freedom to read, uh, the importance of libraries, the importance of schools. These are things that, you know, I felt honored to bring to a national stage that way. Uh, we often take these things for granted and to be able to talk about the importance, especially of libraries, public libraries and school libraries to our senators um, was just really one of the best things I've been able to do. As the board president of the National Coalition Against Censorship, or the NCAC, what do you see as the most pressing challenges facing the fight against censorship today, and how can we address them effectively? So the most pressing challenges are really related to the freedom of expression in many different contexts. So the NCAC takes a very expansive view. We support the right for everyone to have the freedom of expression. So if we talk about things like the protests that are currently happening on college campuses, uh, we take the view that all sides have the right to freedom of expression. They have the right to protest. We've been doing a lot of work with uh, art museums and galleries who have been suppressing various people uh, for their artwork. Often this is from the Palestinian point of view. Um, but the way that NCAC looks at it is that our democracy rests on the foundation of freedom of expression. Um, not necessarily taking a point of view on, you know, what someone's freedom of expression should be, but everybody has the right to freedom of expression. Um, and when we take away that right, we really are taking away our supports for our democracy and the free flow of ideas. Um, and so when we discuss this at the NCAC, we're really talking about how do we make sure that we have programs that support the continual expansion of people's freedom of expression and not take that away in various circumstances, locally, on the state level, federally. Um, we don't do that much internationally, 
but um, we do try to think about like what is happening uh, in, in various countries. So when I was working as a librarian, I did have to argue with other staff members about some of the books that we were putting in the collection. So often what you find with librarians is they'll say like, this is a trash book, right? It's not very well written or for something like that. And therefore we shouldn't have the, li the book. And that's not what libraries are about. They aren't concerned with how well written something is, right? That's not part of the criterion um, criteria. So what I have now though, is nothing compared to what I see with, you know, teachers, librarians, they get doxxed and attacked, their neighbors come after them. Um, I am lucky to have tenure. And so I don't fear for my job when I'm speaking out about fair expression and intellectual freedom. Um, but I do get interesting emails and mail telling me that uh, I need to change my ways. So uh, I don't worry about that. It's a uh, part of the job and I feel very lucky to be tenured and not worry about job security. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Your insights into intellectual freedom and the challenges of censorship are not only enlightening, but essential in our ongoing conversation about the importance of diverse narratives and the open access to information. As a professor, a board president of the NCAC, and a prolific author and researcher, your dedication to advocating for these critical issues underscores the vital role of intellectual freedom in our society. Thank you to Emily Knox for your unwavering commitment to these causes.